local programming on KRWG Public Media made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Your Legislators, a production of KRWG Public Media. Your Legislators is a public service program providing our viewing audience in southern New Mexico the opportunity to hear about important legislative issues directly from their elected representatives in Santa Fe. Hello and welcome to Your Legislators here on KRWG Public Media. I'm your host, Anthony Moreno. Joining us from Santa Fe to talk about the legislative session is District 36 Democratic State Representative Nathan Small. Nathan, thank you so much for being with us on the program. Anthony, it's a treat to be here. Thank you for having me on. Now, I'd like to kick things off uh, talking about some things that have already happened within the legislative session that I, I know you've been a part of, and that has been to create an outdoor recreation department and out outdoor rec uh, equity fund as well. I'd like to hear your thoughts yeah. on that and how, how it's sure. moving forward. Sure. So we, we were, uh, I was so excited to be part of the bipartisan group introducing the Office of Outdoor Recreation with Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, this is really to help grow economic opportunity connected to our outdoor spaces here uh, in the state in the intersection with our incredible uh, culture, our heritage, uh, our food, all of these uh, are very tied to our land and in a unique and way that uh, really makes us think New Mexico could be a region-wide and in fact a national leader. The Outdoor Equity Fund, really exciting, Representative Angelica Rubio has helped really bring that to the table and that's to help ensure that all kids across the state, including folks who don't necessarily have the financial means there in their own home, but that we look for ways to help get them uh, outdoors connected to these places and in so doing really make sure that uh, the state is working for everybody. Very exciting It's a news. Senate bill. Sen yeah, Senator Jeff Steinborn uh, is the leader of that effort, uh, yeah. somebody who helped create the, the Rio Grande Trail a few sessions ago. So yeah. this is, it's a Senate bill uh, with bipartisan support. I'm proud to be a House co-sponsor of it. Um, it's moving forward. You know, this is a session where things are moving. Uh, I think there's an, an, excuse me, a number of different needs. So we've already also, I was part of the, the so-called rocket docket, and that was the 42 pieces of legislation that in previous two sessions had been passed with wide, sometimes unanimous bipartisan support, but vetoed by the previous governor. My piece of legislation was around uh, enhancing value-added agriculture and opportunities to support value-added agriculture throughout the state. This again is something that creates jobs, creates economic opportunity, adds to the opportunity to help keep folks here, um, and the governor signed it. Uh, it was one of the, the pieces of legislation that she mentioned. And I'm so excited, you know, Farm Bureau, others are really excited because this is going to really enhance our opportunities for value added agriculture. Um, and, and I know that, I'm sorry, my, I just want to uh, kind of understand that a little bit. I know sure. obviously our agriculture is so important and crucial to your district. Um, right. You mentioned keep people here. What do you mean by that? Yeah, when we look at value added agriculture by bringing more jobs, by uh, offering more opportunity for folks to be here in New Mexico and, and essentially make a good living off of agricultural work, uh, that's what we mean by help keep people here so that they can find their opportunities, uh, grow a business, uh, you know, become that entrepreneur that helps to market these agricultural products, helps to improve those agricultural products and bring greater value back uh, for them, for their families, for their communities, ultimately for the state. Now, one of the things that I've heard chili producers and farmers talk about is they're concerned about the growing age of their workforce, about sure. them being aged out. And so they've looked at other means like mechanizing uh, green chili yeah. harvesting. Yeah. I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Anything you're working on to address that issue? Yeah, you know, a few things. We have another couple pieces of legislation I'm sponsoring with uh, Representative Paul Bandy, who's a Republican up in the northwest part of the state. That's expanding marketing opportunities for agricultural products here in the state. 
Uh, what we find a lot, and it connects also back to value-added agriculture, is that folks love New Mexico produce. They love our products. They love our brand. But we've got to really help get that brand, get those products out to the widest market possible. And so when folks, you know, when folks have our green chile, they're hooked. They're they're there for life. But we've got to make sure that there's the right kind of collaboration and support to to expand those brands. And so when we look at um, I think bringing more value, certainly there's always uh, really pressures and competitive pressures. You mentioned around labor, uh, around you know perhaps the aging workforce, as you mentioned. Those are, are, are frequent pressures that we have to be addressing the way to help grow and to expand the markets, bring more resources in, is through things like value-added agriculture, expanded marketing, um, that really kind of, at the end of the day, help to grow the pie, help to grow the pot that's able to come back to New Mexico. Um, and, and so that's, that's where a lot of my focus has been this session. It's been great collaborating uh, with a lot. Of, we also have another piece of legislation around healthy soils. So different ways to help um, invest in, support, and grow our agriculture and value-added agriculture economies. Well, speaking of something that's... My that's, earpiece keeps coming uh, out here. Okay, so okay. That. Well, um, I, hope, I hope it's working right now. Um, I just wanted to touch with you about an issue that's not only precious to farmers and people working in agriculture, but all of us uh, here in New Mexico, and that's water. Um, anything that you are concerned with uh, regarding the climate change issue and water in New Mexico, with water in New Mexico, are, what are some of your concerns with your district and the rest sure. of the state? And how do we move forward to address this issue? Yeah, it's really one of the, thank you, Anthony, it's one of the most pressing challenges that we face. We're, again, we have to address these uh, challenges in kind of a multi-pronged approach. Uh, I think one thing that I'll mention, we're very excited, I'm very excited about Senate Bill 489. It's called the Energy Transition Act. And this works to help New Mexico transition to uh, clean renewable energy and then to carbon-free energy. And in fact, it would set uh, standards of carbon-free energy generation by 2000, 2045. We would be 50% renewable energy uh, in the year 2030, 40% by 2025. And this is all a way of looking at, at one, one of the fixes we need to do, which is you know, to emit less carbon through energy generation, especially as, <laughs> excuse me, as we as look towards uh, electric vehicles and electrifying more aspects of, of, of daily life, that electricity generation and cleaner renewable energy uh, utilizing the sun and the wind that we have in such abundance here in New Mexico, the jobs that it will create just makes sense. It's a no-brainer for us. Um, the governor, uh, senators, a number of folks are <laughs> really excited about that effort. So that's one way. Another way is looking at the resources we need to uh, enhance flexibility around uh, water delivery, um, so this is a piece of legislation that I'm carrying around investing in our strategic water reserve. And the strategic water reserve is there with the Interstate Stream Commission. And its purpose is to allow uh, the folks at the ISC to work with communities, stakeholders, uh, producers during uh, challenges, whether that's times of drought, sometimes with the compact delivery challenges with Texas that we've seen on the Pecos now in litigation on the lower Rio Grande and allow the ISC that flexibility to work with folks locally um, to maybe lease or purchase water rights and in so doing avoid greater crises that would necessitate more drastic action. Um, <laughs> so we're, uh, we want to keep wa the, the budgets uh, for studying our groundwater and uh, reserves, our aquifers. We need to understand that better. And so it's really a, a multi-pronged approach that covers um, a many different sectors here in New Mexico and is based upon working closely 
with the the resources, the advantages, the opportunities that New Mexico has in abundance. Right. Again, well, like I, I clean stop energy. You, I, I want to stop yeah. you real quick because you touched on something sure. that's really, really important that I think our viewers would really like to know about, and and that's understanding our groundwater. Now, due to budget cuts in the past, uh, people working to understand that groundwater have told me um, that yeah. they have to select fewer sites, strategic sites, right. to really monitor groundwater right. um, and how right. we're doing in New Mexico due to budget cuts. Is there anything yeah. that you're working on or you think this new administration is going to do to really address that so we, we really have a firm understanding of what sure. our groundwater situation here is in New Mexico? Absolutely. It's, it's a pri priority with the healthier budgets that we have this year, the healthier... <laughs> the healthier outlook moving into next year. Uh, we've been able to reinvest uh, in the aquifer mapping, uh, in looking at our groundwater reserves, working with the, our great research institutions, of course, down uh, back home at New Mexico State University, uh, also with um, New Mexico Tech. And we are, so this year, I think, we will be able to uh, make sure that projects that we're operating at the minimal level due to the budget cuts you mentioned, they'll be able to expand. Uh, and hopefully over the course of the next few years, we'll have a much better picture when it comes to our aquifers, to uh, how our groundwater moves, how aquifers recharge. Uh, and that's going to give us, I think, a better better understanding of how to manage uh, and work with water here in the state, even as we acknowledge um, the a lot of the things that are happening upstream uh, and the difficulties caused by climate change. This is, it brings me back to something I mentioned with the Strategic Water Reserve and to some of the other efforts that we're involved with, which is to really enhance flexibility to create more collaboration and the ability to share and for different stakeholders, different water users to work together. That means also investing in water efficiency, water infrastructure projects uh, throughout the state, including down in Santa Teresa. Uh, and so it's really an interconnected way. Um, it's a place that I think if done right, and we're working on that, uh, you, you bring bipartisan support together to uh, address a shared challenge. Now, you mentioned Santa Teresa. Um, there's been talk about proposing desalination as a way to help get more water um, using that brackish water that right. that is in uh, the Mesilla Bolson. So I was kind of wondering right. your thoughts on that uh, moving forward, dealing with the water issue, especially so, when you're talking so about I, developing that region. Yeah, I, I strongly support the kind of the stakeholder collaboration that's going between Elephant Butte Irrigation District Santa Teresa, you also have the Camino Real Utility Authority there, and you have folks uh, working to do some of those tests using, um, using technology developed there at New Mexico State University. I strongly support that, uh, and I think it's, uh, uh, some of that is proceeding apace now. If there is uh, state support or state collaboration that's needed, we need to be ready to participate in that. Um, some of the key things right now are just enhancing that water and wastewater delivery and conveyance infrastructure there in Santa Teresa, and really excited to be part of that. Very exciting. Now, one uh, thing that's really ca capturing the headlines here is uh, minimum wage in New Mexico. Yeah. And now the House yeah. took action to pass a higher minimum wage. The Senate uh, working on that as well, uh, passing that through. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was kind of wondering um, your thoughts on the minimum wage because you were so crucial in the minimum wage debate while you were a city sure. councilor here in Las Cruces. You were the one kind of leading the compromise on that. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on on the minimum wage moving yeah. forward. So, so thank you. I, I voted for the House legislation with the amendment that essentially phases out the tipped credit over a longer period of time. When we get down to it, um, invest, you know, smart, balanced uh, increases in the minimum wage go right back into the economy. These are going for folks in the research 
we were shown that was cited on the floor shows that uh, oftentimes these are single parents who are working at minimum wage in our state, sometimes working multiple jobs. Um, not the youngest members of our community, as, as is sometimes thought. In fact, folks who you know are make, uh, looking to further their education, you know, taking care of families of their own, and every single cent that that they make is going to go right back into the economy. And so, a smart, balanced approach to this, I think, is important. It's the right way to go forward. There is a great deal of conversation, and I think still. Uh, we will likely see more work in the Senate as we should around things like the tipped credit because it's uh, something that is is a very significant change from the current way things are done. And I think we have to be sensitive, uh, you know, being strong and moving forward with good policy, also sensitive uh, to making sure that that policy is implemented in the right way. And so we expect in the Senate there to be continued discussion and perhaps uh, changes to things specifically around the tipped credit. I've also heard uh, from others, including in the agricultural sector, who are concerned about the rate of implementation. You know, this is, it's a session where there are so many different priorities the state urgently needs to move forward upon. Fortunately, there's you know, we haven't even gotten to education, which when you step back from things is the very biggest issue this yeah. session. Um, and I would uh, like so to I talk think, about that. Let's move on and talk yeah. about that because I know your time is limited and we're, we're almost uh, out of time as well here too. But I want to let you uh, give you a chance to talk about education because of the lawsuit that is looming. Um, of course, we can sure. get back and talk about the minimum wage that's working on going on in the Senate right now. Yeah, but education, I think, the lawsuit, I know you're involved with it. Um, uh, with improving sure. education in the state. That is the thing that's looming over the session. What are your thoughts on how do we improve education here in New Mexico and so, what legislation are you working on? Yeah, thank you. So one of the things that I'm really excited this year is to sit on the House Appropriations and Finance Committee. It's the committee where uh, the budget is created, House Bill 2, and it's the, the place, you know, a budget is really the, the most important document that any um, kind of entity produces and we know that you know whether that's around the kitchen table or here for the state uh, as you mentioned the the Yazi Martinez lawsuit essentially found New Mexico was not educating all of its students uh, sufficiently uh, especially students of color especially uh, students uh, who are bilingual or uh, speaking different languages and we see that in our communities. So with uh, this year, there are a number of substantial improvements in education centered first around the right kind of leadership, and we're so lucky to have Dr. Karen Trujillo as the Secretary of Education, but also around key investments. And those are gonna come in things like the at-risk index, essentially where folks, uh, students uh, who are at, rat, at risk, there's a formula that helps get additional resources to uh, those schools and those students and those classrooms. We're going to have increases in instructional materials, so many stories about teachers buying uh, supplies for their students, uh, materials, books, other things that are crumbling there in the classroom, almost unusable that's going to change with a one-time increase and then sustained investments over time. Uh, looking at an increased bilingual credits and, and really the targeted work, fortunately, with the healthy budget, which I might add is, is coming almost exclusively from the increase in oil production in the southeast part of the state. Um, those, you know, we have the ability to make those investments this year and it's something that I'm really pleased and proud to be part of uh, as we make really needed investments, starting with the right kind of leadership, starting with the right approaches, collaborative approaches with communities, with teachers, with families, but also backed up by strong investments uh, from our state to make sure that our most important resource, our kids, have the, the right opportunities and a bright future. Now, one of the things that is really been brought up dealing with education is 
um, addressing early childhood education in the state yeah. and child well-being yeah. as well. There's been uh, proposals about creating a new department um, to address early childhood education and care within the state. I would like to hear your thoughts on that. And do you think it's something that's sustainable is creating a new department? Is that the answer? Or especially when you have other departments like CYFD and yeah. PED, um, the public education department addressing that issue as well? Yeah, you know, w this is, again, it's an effort that started in the Senate. Of course, we're proud to be doing a number of things in the House. Um, that we we will see, you know, sitting again on, on appropriations, the difficulties in coordinating budgets, things like blended funding, especially around early childhood education, where you have federal funding, you have state funding, you uh, that... Um, if not blended properly, can actually compete and serve, frankly, fewer kids, fewer families, even with more dollars. That's where I think a lot of the idea around uh, this department and that, that um, you know, kind of uh, maybe centralized approach is, is gaining traction. And because, it, you know, you need to coordinate and to blend funding, blend approaches, so I am open to it. We, uh, you know, frequently see um, different approaches, approaches kind of focused on more efficient delivery of services. And especially this year, as we're looking at these increased investments, making sure that those are delivered effectively and efficiently, and they help folks, uh, New Mexicans, kids, families on the ground. That is vitally important, so I'm very open to that conversation. Now, sitting on the House Appropriations Committee, obviously such an important committee, um, how are you going to be able to ensure to taxpayers here in New Mexico that the major investments that are needed in education aren't going to go to just producing more administrative jobs? Can you ensure us that they're going to go to the classroom? Yeah, it's a great question. Again, looking at the school formula with increased uh, oversight and accountability through the public education department, that is absolutely the approach is to put these dollars into the classroom. There will be uh, budget language and investing in uh, the right parts of the funding formula to ensure that that's the case because we all recognize it's needed. Um, I think there's a very strong focus on that this session, collaboration between the legislature and the executive. Now, what other challenges do you see with education? I know that there has been obviously the big and announcement gonna... with, with testing and things like that. Now, I know they're trying to roll out a new form and they're working on that mm -hmm. as well. I mean, any thoughts on that moving forward? You know, the, I think just the the number of things that need to be done, the rate at which all of this has to be done. The magnitude of the challenge, the the kind of core lesson that we're insufficiently educating so many of our students, that putting all of that together presents a, a large challenge in and of itself. Fortunately, I think there is share, shared um, bipartisan uh, work to address the challenges. Uh, we have, I think, good leadership within the public education department. It's going to take um, increased investment, increased oversight, and really collaboration. You know, uh, so much of the last administration was uh, dictation top down to uh, uh, schools, to teachers, to districts, to communities. Hopefully, what we're seeing now is much more of a collaborative approach working with families, with teachers, with schools, and then making the right targeted investments and having the right oversight to make sure that those resources and that approach uh, kind of reach their mark. Now, you serve in and a in key fact, role. I apologize. Again, yeah, and it's, 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 it's really incredible to serve on a House Appropriations this year. I apologize. I actually have a, a piece of legislation around dual credit brought by folks down in southern New Mexico up in house education now. And so I need to, um, uh, I actually have to get up to that committee in order to put the bill on. We're, we're almost um, done. Yeah. I mean, we're almost done here in one minute. Um, can you hang okay. out with us for that?
Sure. Um, of well, Nathan, like being on the House Appropriations Committee, you have a, a pretty big role on that committee. And of course, here in southern New Mexico, we have Doreen Gallegos serving in a big role in the House. Now, there was some criticism right. earlier before sure. the legis legislature kicked off that there wasn't any southern New Mexico representatives chairing any, any major committees. I'd like to hear your thoughts on mm -hmm. that. Yeah. So uh, I when you serve on House Appropriations, which was one of my goals this year, when you serve on House Appropriations, uh, you're ineligible to be a committee chair. And so uh, ultimately, I made the decision that um, I, I will have to, and I ultimately, I made the decision that being on serving on House Appropriations and Finance because of the addressing budgets across the board was the most important thing that I could do to serve District 36 and to serve our community and hopefully really working hard to get that done. I have to unfortunately get up to put that bill on. All right. Anthony, I appreciate you taking time and uh, miss home, but am <laughs> excited to be up here doing the work and appreciate your interest and attention. Hey, Nathan, we look forward uh, to talking cool. with you again, and thanks for giving us the time. All right. Thanks. And we want to thank you for joining us for Your Legislators. Remember, you can always stay updated with news anytime at the region's homepage, krwg.org. Also, we are on social media. Check us out on social media. You can give us a thumbs up on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and you can email us your thoughts as well and story ideas for programs like this. All you have to do is email us your thoughts to feedback at nmsu.edu. We wanna thank Representative Nathan Small for joining us on Your Legislators. And once again, we wanna thank you for joining us. I'm Anthony Morano. we will see you next time.